intellectual insecurity. I mean, you might have it. You know, do you ever just think to yourself that the things that you have to say, the things you have to think are just insignificant? It's a little small, it's a little tiny. Because you're being real with yourself for a moment. Like, you're just being honest with yourself. You're not special. You're not important. Oh, oh, look at this. Look at what's behind me. You thought this was you? What? You thought you were that guy. You thought you were that cool and that smart. And like you had all that to say. You actually thought you were William and Craig. You actually thought you were Alvin Plantinga. You, do you hear yourself? Do you, have you looked in a mirror lately? Have you got, oh, that's a nice beard. Do you have a beard yet? No, you don't because you're 14 years old. You can't grow beards. All you can do is put the little thing in your chin. No, that's not it. And maybe those are the things that you're thinking to yourself that, uh, hey, I don't have anything to offer here. I'm not as smart as this dude over there or here, man, over here. Don't I'm not special. I'm just not built that way. I got nothing to offer. Stupid. Maybe I should don't just feel a little chill ashamed? out. Maybe I should just stop. How do you feel about this? Do you think that's weird? Do you think it's well, hopefully in this video, <laughs> like and subscribe, we'll be able to go from A to B, from here to there. Maybe we'll be able to go from, oh no, I'm just so insecure. I doubt myself. I can't accomplish anything. And maybe instead we can go to be a little bit more like, hmm. I might be able to do things. To First of all, let's just ask ourselves little questions like, hmm, what is intellectual insecurity? You arrive at a being which is an uncaused, beginningless, time. Broadly speaking, it's what I'm going to be using in order to refer to just various things that have to pertain to your own view of yourself with respect to your intellect. Feelings of anxiety, insignificance, and inferiority complex. Well, as if, you know, you're not all that smart and you're not, you don't have all these things to offer. And when you engage with intellectualism, uh, maybe you just shouldn't, because, whoa, it's still not you. Have I personally ever felt intellectual insecurity? Now, what inspired me to make this own video is, you know, my own feelings of intellectual insecurity with respect to my own capabilities. Yes. Yes. Um, I think this is something that I would hope everyone gets at some point in their life. Being fairly blunt, I know I'm a smart person. I know I'm I'm very bright. I know I know a, I know that I know a lot of things. Um, because we grow up and we start to realize how big the square of ideas really is, and we notice how little we are. Kind of like when we discovered how big space is and how small the earth is, we kind of figure out how small our intellect is compared to the intellect of the entire world. And we think, you know, what are the odds that I'm right? Um, what are the odds that I have the correct worldview? But my intellectual insecurity doesn't come from the fact that I think I'm not a smart person or that I, I suffer from imposter syndrome, which sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. I experience those feelings, eh? here and there. Sometimes it's not present at all, other times it's like, yeah, it just eats away. And you know, I, it does come from, I think it comes from me, it comes from a sense of not being recognized for my intellect, not being recognized and appreciated for my achievements and what I'm currently looking at and how, you know, I'm shaping and I'm shaping my area of research in the context of wider, wider academia, theological academia. And so that's where my intellectual security comes from. And uh, it's not fun, it's not great and you know, if I'm experiencing these things, if I go about looking at myself thinking, oh boy, it's not me, then perhaps you do sometimes as well. Obviously not all of you, this isn't gonna be relevant to all you dudes, but some of you might also feel the same way I. No, I'm a dude who takes very seriously the uh, Socratic phrase that uh, the unexamined life is not worth living. As Socrates says, as he's on trial for radicalizing the youth. Radicalize, uh, radicalize your Radical youth pastors, love. kids. That's right. But Gwens and Olsen over here also take that phrase pretty seriously in their own book when they take it and then twist it in their own way for their own purposes to say something more along the lines of the unreflective faith is not worth believing. Or something like that. 
Now that statement was made in the context of them trying to convince you that hey, you, a normal person who uh, does theology, you should probably, instead of doing it so implicitly as you always do, even if you reject the idea that you do theology, you're doing it, go watch these videos. They try to convince you, instead of doing it implicitly like you always do, maybe you should do it explicitly. Now, obviously in order to do theology explicitly, that requires some movement on your part. That requires you to make some active steps. Now, we've already discussed how you can make those active steps in the past. Let's discuss briefly, how will those active steps affect you? How intellectual insecurity has impacted my sense of self? Not really. I mean, again, I think there's a difference between what you know to be true and what um, the outside influences that try to tempt you into thinking something about yourself that's not true. Um, I think it's really helped me um, kind of get rid of any type of overbearing sense of self that I have. Spaceless, enormously powerful. If everybody is practicing theology, then we are all going to be doing it at various levels to varying degrees. And all the levels come with their own special little perks and quirks. However, the dude who struggles with their own intellectual insecurity despite the oh, pleasures of being man. able to do theology at different levels, might still think to themselves, ah, well, you know, yeah, talk. I just don't know. I mean, just whatever arbitrary reason I can concoct, eh, that's just, I just can't really do theology, you know? I mean, can't really do philosophy either. I'm just not that smart. I'm not that great. As if to say, uh, the intellectual gatekeepers are correct, as opposed to being something more along the lines of, I don't know, full of themselves. No, intellectual insecurity could mean all sorts of different things to all sorts of different people. As for myself, the insecurity mostly comes in the form of imposter syndrome, like despite being able to do theology and as far as I'm concerned, fairly well, my own insecurities might tell me that, hey, I'm just not very good at it anyway. And like, oh, look at all these dudes. Wow, look at all these dudes right here. Look at all them. Look at those guys. They do it better than me. Like, what am I doing? participating in this little discipline that I love so much when these dudes do it better and they have a platform and they you know they deserve the recognition that they have and I just I'm just not as good as them I'm not as good at formulating arguments I'm not as good at reading the Bible I'm not as good as X Y and Z and they have the platform to prove it and I do not maybe I'm just not all there maybe I'm just not all that maybe I'm imposter syndrome a feeling of anxiety with respect to your own successes and your own engagement in a discipline. Your success may feel unearned, like you shouldn't deserve any recognition or reward that you get because, well, some stupid reason. And like any engagement that you have in this discipline or activity is purely pretend. Why is it purely pretend? Oh, because all these dudes back here are objectively better at this thing than I am. So clearly, I should not be participating. Is what you might think to yourself is the perception that you may have, imposter syndrome. I think the way that um, it still impacts me today is that just it continues to allow me to love everybody. Um, it allows me to love their ideas, their minds, um, in a way that I don't think I could if I was 100% confident in what I believe. Do I know others who have experienced intellectual insecurity? If so, what do I think was the cause of this for them? I know a ton. I mean, bear in mind, being an academic theologian and recently presenting a paper at a conference, I've had to network a lot. And I do network a lot with other scholars, other academics. And so I talk to other people about it. One, I'll use one case study in particular, a good friend of mine, one of my best mates. He, um, he feels, and he's one of the smartest folks I've ever met. And he feels intellectual insecurity. As far as I'm aware, part of it is the fact that in, in the same way, you know, he doesn't have that kind of platform that I, I, you know, think that one needs to have to not be intellectually insecure. Um, but at the same time, he suffers quite a bit with imposter syndrome. Kind of, he's really smart, he does really well, but he doesn't feel like he deserves it. And so um, that kind of feeds into his intellectual insecurity. However, that said, intellectual insecurity is not just, you know, it doesn't just come in the form of imposter syndrome, perhaps you don't participate in the various intellectual disciplines 
Not because you have a feeling of, oh, when I do, I feel like an imposter. Perhaps you don't engage because you think, well, that's for them and I'm not like them. I'm not smart like them. I don't have the big brain like them. I just, I didn't do very well in school. Perhaps you've got a preconception about the kind of people who do engage in these sorts of activities or the kind of people who should engage in these sorts of activities. And you, as far as you're concerned, you do not feel as though that you mix well with them. You do not feel like you really should be involved in such disciplines if those are the kinds of people that you perceive to be involved. Perhaps you don't consider yourself very well read or well learned. When you went to school, you didn't do very well. Or you think that the people who are involved in these disciplines are just kind of full of it and just kind of look down upon dudes like yourself who are ordinary and have questions and don't understand what via negativa means. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm not a dictionary, thanks. And if that's you, then like, okay, fair enough, understandable. There's a distinction that we should be making between those who feel like we can't be involved in these disciplines and those who are just broadly uninterested. Hey, yo, levels of theology right here. Grenz and Olsen. I think their levels of theology spectrum is very helpful, not just for uh, showing you what various levels people do theology at, but also helping you um, place yourself into that spectrum to then see, like, who am I? Who are my peers? Who am I on the same level as? And is it okay to not know everything? Is it okay to, like, not fully be there? Is it okay to not be this guy and just be an ordinary dude? Yeah, yeah of course it is. Uh, I think some of the effects of intellectual insecurity um, lend themselves to good and bad things. Um, I think on the good end, you find people who are very willing to consider ideas radically different from their own um, because they're not so solid and confident um, in what they already currently believe in. Um, I think it can also breed. Um, I think it can breed some strong agnosticism, in which no one, uh, the person, really doesn't make any strong um, assertions about anything, and I think that can be destructive to one's lifestyle when they don't really know black from white, or they don't really they can't really categorize any information as like this this thing is more true than that. Um, it, I think it would be hard to figure out how to live under, under that context. When it's just the dudes with the massive brains, like, all the conversation becomes is stuff that they are interested, stuff that pertains to them in their world. And a lot of the dudes out here on the floor, a lot of the dudes who might be thinking, oh, that's not for me because I'm not smart like them. They're living real life stuff. They're living real world things. They have actual experiences. Hey, you, you're probably going through what's called a <coughs> cost of living crisis, or a cost of housing crisis, or a cost of energy crisis, or just a, or you're just getting slapped at the back of the skull with car payments, and it sucks. It's nice learning about uh, the ontological argument. <laughs> I ontologically can't feed my children. <laughs> And we can talk about that sort of stuff theologically, but a lot of the dudes in charge of the uh, stuff that we get to talk about, I don't know, as far as I'm concerned, they're not really talking about anything interesting. They're not really talking about things that matter to your real life experience. And that tends to be the way that theology goes when the dudes like us, you and me, disengage and just let the big the big, big massive brains talk. When we just let them go all day long, the professionals, the academics, without any input into what us ordinary dudes are talking, feeling, and experiencing, what follows is theology becomes irrelevant and has nothing to say into our real lives. That's why you are important. That's why we can't risk you getting all intellectually insecure and going all meh, nya, nya, nya. I'm just not there, it's not for me. When in all actuality, you've got so much to offer to us because you are living the real life experience. You are living the day to day. The solutions that I have found to deal with my intellectual insecurity have been kind of just to recognize that I'm not abnormal for having this and that the way I should deal with it, I think the best way to deal with it um, is to become more aware of what's out there. I think if 
the more mystery you have about the public square of ideas, the more hostile it'll seem to you. Ultimately, I'm always going to feel this sense of insecurity in relation to someone else because comparison is a killer. You know, if I'm comparing myself to someone else who is much clear, clearly much better at what they do because they're far more experienced, then that's only going to fuel the fire of intellectual insecurity when it doesn't need to because I'm 24. The vast majority of people I'm reading are like twice, three times my age. And I think it might, if you start dipping your toes in the pool and you're like, oh, it's not so cold or it's not so hot, um, I think it's a lot easier to you know, dive into the deep ends um, and not be too worried about where you'll end up. Um, like I said, I don't think that we can choose what really convinces us and what doesn't. And so I think the best thing you can do is to just dive into it, um, not be too worried where you end up. Um, because, you know, the more information you go through, I think the better. Um, the more likely you'll find truth, you know, just prob probability-wise. If you're not born with it, it's out there somewhere. So you should, I think you should go chasing for it, um, like a car, like a dog after a taxi. And so, um, one of the big things for me is I recognize that I'm, I'm young. I've got a lot to do yet. This is only just the beginning for me. Um, and so for those that do struggle with intellectual security, you're not alone. Again, I think one of the biggest things is not only encouraging others in their intellectual pursuits, but encouraging, uh, encouraging yourself and recognizing that you are not the smartest person in the room and you never will be. Um, and I think the beginning is probably the hardest part um, of really trying, because when you start really questioning everything, is you, the first thing you question is yourself. And then you start questioning other ideas. I think that's where you should start because the easier it is to question yourself, I think the easier it is to think critically um, with the least amount of bias. You know, we can never get fully rid of bias, but um, I think questioning yourself is a really good place to start and it's definitely the hardest. Because I'm not the smartest person and because I don't know everything, there's far more opportunity for me to learn and the fruit that will bear to be born from my learning will be far greater than the the life lived knowing everything in comparison to everybody else. So what's my point? What's my point? You got stuff to offer. Just because you're not like smart like this dude back here doesn't necessarily mean you don't have anything to offer. Doesn't mean that you're not right when you say X or Y. Maybe we should uh, consider being wrong occasionally a joy to experience because then we discover, hey, well, I've crossed out X, but maybe we still have Y and Z to cover. Kierkegaard says that, uh, you know, life is not a problem to be solved, but a reality to be experienced. I don't know how that pertains to what we've been talking about, but I feel like it does. So, go you. You're not that silly. You're not that stupid. You can do it.